Good morning, Colin and Joyce, Abby, and I don't know if Nora I saw her name up earlier. Um, good to have you here and welcome to those who are watching at just now and those who watch later. It's the first Sunday in the period of the church's year that we call Lent, where we start to prepare for Easter. And so some of the thoughts and readings, and the reading today, reflects that theme. We're going to begin our act of worship here in the church in Kinloch Leven um, with some words that we're going, Mary and myself are going to share together. We're both here today and welcome Rona as well and yeah, Colin. We, we are, are a holy, holy people. people. Summoned, loved, loved and, and blessed by God. We, we worship together in spirit and in truth and in precious fellowship. May, May we live together in unity, seek knowledge in freedom and serve, and serve humanity in fellowship. May we, May we grow in hunger for God's word and in a common desire to follow Jesus. Jesus. Our first hymn for this morning is Come Every Soul by Sin Oppressed. There's mercy with the Lord. He will surely give you rest by trusting in his word. Only trust him, only trust him, only trust him now. He will save you, he will save you, he will save you now. Yes, Jesus is the truth, the way that leads you into rest. Believe in him without delay and you are fully blessed. Only trust him, only trust him, only trust him now. He will save you, he will save you, he will save you now. Sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord, and He will surely give you rest by trusting in His word. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him now. He will save you, He will save you. He and Mark who've joined us as well and to others who are joining us shortly we're going to join together now in prayer let us pray Lord eternal God of love and Lord of salvation we come before you today we come because you are a holy God and you are our maker the God who has brought us into being and given us life and restored us and called us in Jesus Christ we thank you for your amazing love that has given us Jesus as our friend and saviour. We thank you that you have gathered us as your people into the church. And even though, Lord, Lord, we can't just now worship in one place, yet wherever we are, we join together in unity, gathered by your Spirit, even at this hour, that it shall be a hallowed hour where we might meet with you, the living God. Wherever we are, Lord, at home, at church, or out and about, may we know and experience your hand of blessing upon us. How great you are, O Lord, worthy to be praised. You are a holy and living God. As we come before you today, we thank you that you 
love us with an unfailing love. And you've called us into your family. But so often, Lord, we fall short. We think of the many times where we have hurt others, either by what we've done or not done, by our failure to do good, by our neglect of your word. But we thank you that you've sent Jesus to be our saviour and our friend. And so we ask, Lord, for your mercy upon us. Help us to hear those words that Jesus spoke. My child, my son, your sins are forgiven. And Lord, what a wonderful thing it is to know that grace, that forgiveness, that mercy, and that peace as we seek you. May we find you as we call upon you. May we know you near us. As we ask, may we receive. And as we knock, may the door be opened to us. <coughs> As indeed you have said it shall be. Grant us the help of your Spirit that we may worship you and through Scripture and the hearing and preaching of your Word that we may grow in grace and understanding and commitment that we may honour you by our lips and by our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going now um, to read from Psalm 91, and there's, again, both Mary and myself will share this, but there's a, a bit that, we all, that is repeated, a kind of response, and the response is, be with me, Lord, when I am in trouble. So when we hear that, we all join in. Be with me, Lord, when I am in trouble. You who dwell in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, say to the Lord, my refuge and fortress, my God in whom I trust. Be with me, Lord, when, when I'm, I'm in, in trouble. trouble. No, no evil shall befall you, nor shall affliction come near your tent. For to his angels he has given command about you. They will guard you in all, their, all your ways. Be with, Be with me, me, Lord. Lord. When, when I, I am, am in trouble. trouble. Upon their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the asp and the viper. You shall trample down the lion and the dragon. Be with, Be with me, me, Lord, when, when I, I am in trouble. trouble. Because he clings to me, I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he acknowledges my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in distress. I will deliver him and glorify him. Be with me, Lord, when I, I am, am in, in trouble. trouble. Our Gospel reading for this morning comes from Luke. Chapter 4, and the verses are from 1 to 14, and they describe the temptation of Jesus. Luke, chapter 4, verses 1 to 14. Jesus returned from the Jordan, full of the Holy Spirit, and was led by the Spirit into the desert where he was tempted by the devil for forty days. In all that time he ate nothing, so that he was hungry when it was over. The devil said to him, If you are God's son, order the stone to turn into bread. But Jesus answered, The scripture says, Human beings cannot live on bread alone. Then the devil took him up, and showed him in a second all the kingdoms of the world. I will give you all this power and all this wealth, the devil told him. It has all been handed over to me, and I can give it to anyone I choose. All this will be yours then, if you worship me. Jesus answered, 
The scripture says, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and set him on the highest point of the temple and said to him, If you are God's son, throw yourself down from here. For the scripture says, God will order his angels to take good care of you. It also says, they will hold you up with their hands so that not even your feet will hurt on the stones. But Jesus answered, the scripture says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil finished tempting Jesus in every way, he left him for a while. Then Jesus returned to Galilee and the power of the Holy Spirit was with him. The news about him spread throughout all that territory. Amen. Our second hymn for today is I Stood One Day at Calvary. I stood one day at Calvary where Jesus bled and died. I never knew he loved me so, for me was crucified. And as I stood there in my sin, his love reached down to me, and oh, the shame that filled my soul that day at Calvary. I prayed one day at Calvary, I'm thine forevermore. Forgive me, Lord, for all my sin, my lost estate restore. And as I prayed, to me he gave salvation full and free. And oh, the peace that filled my soul that day at Calvary. I stood one day at Calvary where Jesus bled and died. I never knew he loved me so, for me was crucified. And as I stood there in my sin, his love come to me. And all the sin. Reflect on God's word, let's pray together. Loving God, as we come before you, we thank you for your amazing love, which we see in all the things that Jesus did, especially as we think of this time leading up to Easter itself. Help us use this time of Lent to be more ready to worship you, to be more faithful to you, to be close to you, to know your love better. Speak to us today of your love and the love of Jesus, and we pray in his name. Amen. We are at the start of Lent, which is traditionally a time where we think about our own lives and reflect upon our own need to follow Jesus and his way better. We also think of Jesus as he began that time of his public activity that would lead him to the cross. And that was not an outcome that the disciples particularly wanted or wished for. When Jesus started speaking of a time ahead when the Son of Man, when he would be put to death and rejected and betrayed and put to death, Peter 
was most adamant, Lord, this must not happen to you. But Jesus would not allow such a train of thought to be ex expressed or encouraged. For Peter was then acting as the tempter, as Satan, who wanted to deflect Jesus from his God-appointed path. Jesus knew the scriptures. He knew them inside out that spoke of God's servant who would suffer and die and be buried. And yet God would honour him for this because this was the will of the, of the Lord. But to be sure, the devil, the tempter, did not want Jesus to go to the cross because the devil knew that that would spell his own defeat. For it was through the cross and resurrection that sin and death and the devil would finally be overcome, be destroyed. In this passage today, we learn of how right after his baptism, the Spirit of God led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. Because that was important. That was to be part of the work of Jesus, to over, overcome the tempter. And it was part of the work of Jesus as the second Adam. When you think, we all know the story of what happened in the Garden of Eden with the first Adam. When Adam accepted the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, despite God's strict instructions not to take of it. He partook of it, he took it from Eve, who herself had been persuaded by the serpent that she should take it, that it would be in some way a good thing to do. And that first Adam and Eve, through their compromise, through their act of betrayal, through their act of doing what the serpent wanted, not what God wanted, their status changed. Their fellowship with God altered. They felt shame. They no longer felt comfortable to be in God's presence. And that story, of course, is not just the story of the first Adam and Eve. It's the story of the whole human race ever since. What the first Adam did defines the pattern of what came afterwards. And so, for us too, we so often will choose not what God commands but what seems appealing or nice or good. But Jesus, the second Adam, triumphed where the first Adam had failed. And Jesus triumphed where the people of Israel had failed. God had led the Israelites into the desert for, for 40 years to test them by hunger, to prove their character, to show and prove that they would be obedient to God, and yet by and large they did not succeed in that. But in his 40 days in the wilderness, Jesus broke the pattern. He interrupted the cycle of temptation and fall. And isn't it wonderful, we have a Saviour who has overcome and who is able to help us in our weakness whenever we turn to him and as we trust him. Let's be sure that, let's be quite sure, we should be quite sure in our minds that being tempted in itself is not a sin. And it's not a sign of failure either. It would be a sin if we yielded to temptation, if we gave in to it, if we did what the tempter wanted. And we can be tempted in different ways to compromise our standards or our faith. If we resist temptation, however, it becomes a way of growth in the Christian life. We become stronger. And so that's one reason why we should focus on the different ways in which Jesus was tempted and overcame those temptations. He was tempted in the wilderness to compromise his character and his calling. One of the things the devil suggested was that he might achieve fame 
by doing spectacular things, such as turning stones into bread, producing lots and lots of food. That would get him fame very quickly. Also, in his, Jesus was taken in his mind's eye to the bit of the temple, the pinna pinnacle of the temple, and there was a sheer drop below, right down, down to the Kidron Valley. And in his mind's eye, the devil was saying to him, you can throw yourself down from such a place and you'll be supported by the angels. To do such a thing would have been a distortion of Christ's true calling. He was called to be the suffering servant, to achieve his work, not by doing spectacular things, but by self-denial and sacrifice. And he was also tempted to compromise his character as the Son of God because the devil showed him all, in a, presumably again in his mind's eye, all the kingdoms of the world and said, these can be yours if, if you bow down and worship me. If, if only he would worship Satan, he could have such easy and immediate access to power and influence and wealth. To go for this option, Jesus would have had to compromise everything about his calling and character. What a price that would have been to pay. Isn't it true that Jesus was right to say no? And he said, said no firmly, using scripture. And finally, having resisted the devil firmly and clearly, the devil left him for a, a season, for a time. So many people, of course, in life have fallen victim to temptation by compromising standards of honesty and goodness, going for the quick fix. We can be persuaded in so many different ways to compromise our faith or our standards. We can be persuaded, for example, that we should keep quiet about our faith, keep it a secret almost. We can be persuaded to bow down to the world's agenda, to its ideas of power or wealth or influence, its values, its love of money. Remember the, the rich young man in the Gospels, who's mentioned in all the three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke. He wanted to know how he could inherit the kingdom of God. And Jesus said to him, you know the commandments. But the man said, I know them, I followed them already, but the man wanted more. And Jesus said, well, there's only one thing left. Sell all you have, give it away to the poor, and then you'll have treasure in heaven. And then come, follow me. The man had great riches, and he went away. He was sad because he really felt he couldn't part with them. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. And somehow we've got to learn to sit easy to what the world considers wealth, goodness, treasures. Temptation is, as Jesus found about not compromising, our calling or our character or bowing down to something other than the one true God. Remember the first two, two commandments in the Ten Commandments, I am the Lord your God and you shall have no other gods but me. Before me, Jesus said you cannot worship God and mammon. Notice how Jesus resisted temptation by holding fast to the word of God. He quoted it. It is written, the scripture says, we can be persuaded to dilute God's word in different ways or depart from it, but we must not. We have to know scripture. And that means not just using any verse that supports what you want to, want to do, looking for a a word in, in the Bible that supports what you've decided to do. It's understanding Scripture and the pattern of it and looking 
for an understa a wider understanding of it. I'm sure that ignorance of the Bible is a great tool in the devil's hand. That's why we need to read the Bible. Another thing, we don't promote God's kingdom by going for the spectacular. The, the church can be tempted to um, pursue its agenda by um, going for things that are entertaining or exciting. But the foundation of the Protestant faith is sola scriptura. Um, we follow scripture and its authority. We don't seek to recover the church's influence by an agenda that the world sets, whether that's a business agenda or a desire for excitement. We make our appeal by the word of God. And another thought is that we hold on to who we are as God's people, as God's children. And that's resisting temptation is not losing sight of who we are, have been called to be, who Jesus has drawn us into fellowship with himself and with the Father. We don't lose sight of that. We hold on to that and what that means. And that's resisting temptation is about holding on to who we are as God's children. Viktor Frankl was a Jewish psychiatrist who um, became a prisoner, a prisoner at Auschwitz in 1944 and 1945. He survived the ordeal, um, though his wife didn't and his mother didn't. And he wrote about his experiences and the experiences of those he witnessed in that camp. And one of the things he described is how so many people grew numb and apathetic. But those who had an inner grip on life, who had a, held on to some sense of the future, perhaps had some faith, fared better. And they didn't regress, but rather grew. And to me that's saying the importance of holding on to who we are in faith in order to um, not be pulled down by the things that can assail us, the, the things that the devil might throw at us. Jesus was tempted. Jesus overcame and Jesus himself grew in the experience. We're told in Luke's account, which I read, we had read today, Marion read, was that Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit, filled with the Spirit's power. When we overcome temptation, where it leads to an accession, a, an increase of the Spirit, Holy Spirit's power in us. As Christians, we know, or we should know, that the devil is still at work. He's the enemy of the Christian. He is to be resisted. But as we entrust ourselves to Jesus, as we get to know Jesus better, as we follow Jesus more, we at one level want to do what's right. We, we want to do what Jesus says and what Jesus does himself. But not only that, we find an inner strength that God gives to live out our Christian calling, to follow Jesus better, to do the right thing, and to learn how to do that better. Amen and thanks be to God for these thoughts that I, and for this reflection on his holy word, and to him be glory and praise. We bring to you a chorus which says this. The Saviour can solve every problem. The tangles of life can undo. There is nothing too hard for Jesus. There is nothing that he cannot do. <laughs> On this 
first stage of our Lenten journey. We need to think about our freedom to choose what kind of path we will take through our lives and also to consider what obstacles will lie in our way. In our faith, we walk with Jesus even when we, dis when we struggle with difficult questions. We embark on a spiritual journey with him and our journey ends on a Friday in Jerusalem for the cross is standing on a hillside. But in the days to come, we have an opportunity to reflect on how to deal with temptation. When Jesus taught his followers how to pray, he specifically includes the words, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This phrase makes a connection between a spiritual path of obedience to God's will, one which actively seeks out the good and learning to guard against choosing evil because we all get tempted and tested. And temptation is something we all can recognise. Like the story of a newly married man who was sitting at his desk paying his bills when he happened upon the credit card bill. As he scanned through the charges, he noticed one particular charge to a department store for £250. He called for his wife to join him and when she entered the room, he asked her, how could you do this? What on earth did you buy for 250 pounds? Well, she said, I was standing in the department store looking for a dress. Then I found myself trying one on. It was like the devil was whispering to me, you look great in that dress. You should buy it. Well, the young husband answered, you should know how to deal with the devil. Just tell him, get behind me, Satan. I did, retorted the wife. But then he said it looked great from the back too. So I bought it. The early Christian theologian, Origin of Alexandria, wrote an extensive meditation on the Lord's Prayer, and he commented that being religious people does not stop us from being tempted or falling into evil ways. In fact, it might be our very piety that makes us arrogant and full of pride, taking the scriptures and using them as if we owned them, using them to prop up what we want and not listening to what Jesus tells us through the Gospels. In conclusion, temptation is a very real force in our world. Let me read to you an example of a young man who wrote this. I was stuck in a low-paying job and badly wanted a bit more money. One of my colleagues was heavily into cocaine. He used to phone his dealer and a courier would bike it round. I would be sent to pick it up from outside of our work building. One day the courier said, you could make extra money like I do, it's easy. You'll never get caught. All sorts of things flashed before my eyes. No more struggling to pay bills, taking my wife out, buying my kids nice things, saving up for a holiday. I thought about it, and then I thought about the people buying the drugs and what I'd be getting into. So I prayed not to be tempted, and although I was very tempted, I said no. 
Lent is meant to be a time of reflection and self-examination, as well as a time for inner healing, when we can examine our attitudes, our ways of responding, and root out such things as bitterness and unforgiving thoughts about others. The Lenten season is a time to allow the spotlight of the Holy Spirit to bring to the surface all those areas that have brought failure and disappointment. It is a time of hope for us as well. For no matter how far we have strayed away from his plan for us, God is there to lead us back to safety. His protection is there for us each day, even when we are tempted. And now, let us pray. Father God, we thank you for the gift of our lives, for your protection around us, your guiding hand upon us, your steadfast love within us. We thank you for friendship and duty, for joys that cheer us, and trials that teach us to trust in you. Most of all, we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Saviour, and for the living presence of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the journey of life, for all that we have been, and for all that is yet to come. We are challenged daily with reports of tragedy, poverty, and injustice in the news and in our communities. May we support those who highlight the problems and those who are moved to care. We remember those who are tempted to feel there is no hope, no future, and we pray that your Holy Spirit may come alongside them, refreshing and renewing, breathing new life with an encounter with Jesus, so that he might fill each day with the joy of knowing love, love which forgives, grace which redeems, and mercy which includes each new life into the community of faith. We live in a land of plenty, but there are many still in need. We pray for the poor of our nation, the unemployed, the hungry, and the marginalized. Holy Spirit, guide our daily living and the stewardship of the gifts we each have received, that we might share without counting the cost, reach out without prejudice or judgment, include without condition, love without seeking reward, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. O oh, may your peace be there for those who have lost family and friends in recent times and in dreadful trials. And may the healing power of Christ make whole broken hearts, unite communities where there has been loss, and create hope in those who remain. God of grace and glory, we rejoice that Jesus went before us to prepare a place for the faithful who in your time would follow. We remember those who have died in the faith. Comfort those who mourn with your great mercy. Loving Father, our families and friends, our neighbours and acquaintances, and all those who are dear to us are now brought to your presence. We pray for the sick, Tony Gordon, John in Glasgow, Maureen Rivers, Marion Sweeney, and in Kent, Fiona, Paul, and the girls. 
We pray for those in care homes. Mary McPherson, Christina Hunter, Sarah or Moira McLeod, Joanne Grant, John Deere, Pat Kane, Brenda Spence, Isabel MacDonald, Jesse Craig, and James Scott. In the silence, we think of them. Comfort those who are in trouble or upset. Pour out your generous love that peace may reign. We now pray as Jesus taught us to pray together, saying, Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our final hymn for this morning is, O Jesus, I have promised. O oh Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. Be thou forever near me, my master and my friend. I shall not fear the battle if thou art by my side, nor wander from the pathway if thou wilt be my guide. O oh, let me feel thee near me, the world is ever near. I see the sights that dazzle, the tempting sounds I hear. My foes are ever near me, around me and within. But Jesus, draw thou nearer and shield my soul from sin. <laughs> of God, which is beyond all understanding, guard your hearts and your thoughts in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you and with all whom you love, both now and forevermore. Amen. So that's Thank you everybody for watching and sharing in our service today and have, have a good week everybody, um, stay well.
Stay safe and God bless. Bye for now. Bye for now.